Good morning. morning. We welcome you uh, to church today on the second Sunday of Lent. Uh, We're glad you're here to spend a few moments looking at our announcements for the day. So we're currently uh, taking candy donations for the Easter egg hunt. And uh, there are empty, I was going to say shells, that's not the right word, right? Empty eggs, okay, they are kind of shells though. You can take them and uh, you can fill them up with candy. Just make sure that they're wrapped. Alternatively, if you just go to Walmart, dollar store or something, you can pick up a big bag for like a dollar or something if you'd rather uh, do that. But if you need some, they are back there and you can pick them up. Uh, the Easter egg hunt is going to be on uh, first April 1st. Okay. Uh, Tuesday in the Word Bible study. Uh, coming up uh, with Alice this, this uh, Tuesday, 11 a.m. You're welcome to, there, to attend there. Here's our weekly schedule, everything that's happening this week. And upcoming, uh, then we have uh, next lesson in Alice's Bible study, which is Jesus, our teacher. That is on the 14th, so it's two outs. And then uh, we'll have our story Bible study on Thursday the 16th, and it will be on Paul's final days. That's not this Thursday, but the following Thursday. So we're going to have a family-friendly movie night. Uh, It will be on St. Patrick's Day night, actually, Friday the 17th. And it'll be for children and uh, adults alike, I guess. It's kind of, and we have a couple ideas of what the movie will be. There will be some popcorn and then another surprise snack, one of my favorites. So if you want to come, bring your chair, whatever. Uh, All ages are welcome. And it's time to fellowship and get together. And we had a very successful uh, game morning a couple weeks ago. So we had... uh, Lots of children there, and it went pretty calmly because a lot of parents were there, and they helped supervise and everything, so it was a really cool thing. So any other announcements that you would like to share uh, today? So uh, Kathy, I talked to Alice and her husband to get their picture taken, so they're on, you may not have seen it, so they're here and ready, so, and we do need, there's a lot of people, we got a lot more than we had before, but there's still a lot missing, so the directory looks, take a few moments and sign up in the next week or two or three, I think, and let Kathy take your picture so we can have a complete directory with everyone's pictures. I know uh, some of you are not there, so it only takes, how long does it take to get their picture? Like a minute. So please take a minute because Kathy's volunteered to do this and so we can have a cower directory with everybody in it. If you have a favorite picture too, you can just send it to us. Yeah, if you already have one, you can send it by email to Kat, to the office email. So I'm using uh, the old-fashioned English word, I'm beseeching you to go ahead and uh, get your picture taken or send one in. Any other announcements? Anything else? Well, let's uh, start our worship. If you would uh, please join for opening prayer, and then we'll join in the call to worship to follow. Let's let's pray together. As we progress through Lent, our Father, enable us to deepen our spiritual lives. Teach us to pray rightly that we may know the blessing of being rooted and grounded in your spirit. Focus our minds upon Christ, for it is in him that we see the pattern we are to follow Lost it is in his name we pray, amen. Gather round, we have come for worship. We may have come as dry and thirsty souls, longing for refreshment and hope. Lord Jesus, may the Holy Spirit come upon us now. In our worship, may we be blessed and may we find the joy of eternal life. So our first uh, hymn today is What a Friend We Have in Jesus.
may be seated as we worship God uh, with the presentation of our tithes and offerings. I know we got some real little ones to hear uh, today, but if you want to come up, if Reagan and, and Lawson want to come up and play, uh, go ahead, let them play away. Um, I don't know if we have any older ones, but there's some uh, lesson for them to work on also. Let's uh, worship God today with the presentation of our tithes and offerings. Gracious and loving God, we thank you for another beautiful day that you have given to us. But we know that the beauty of our days is just not based upon the sunshine and the weather that we see. It's based upon your sonship, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that as we get closer, Lord, uh, to the Easter season and our days are lengthening, that you would indeed be with us, Lord. That you would bless us, Lord, as we give back to you of our tithes and offerings, our prayers, our gifts, our service, all that we do to make your kingdom better, we give to you. And we thank you, Lord, for giving to us, your son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. You may be seated as we continue in a time of prayer. Lawson can get a lollipop too if, he like, if he's able and he likes them. Yeah, it's like... Pure sugar is hard to turn down. So we'll open up for uh, your prayers and uh, praises today. El Go ahead, Ellis. I have an update on our daughter's boyfriend, Patrick, and his eye situation. Okay. Um, 
he's doing better, but they're still going to have to keep the bubble in his eye for quite a while. So continued prayers for that. Thank you. We'll continue uh, to keep Patrick in our prayers. Thank you, Alice. Uh, Paul in the back there. I uh, have a few things to talk about. Um, first of all, Rich, uh, he's coming along. We uh, take him to dialysis three days a week and uh, helping uh, care him as much as we could. And um, our house, uh, all three of us went to the PCP this week for an appointment, and um, Nancy and Brian had to go to a good uh, checkup and their blood work come back real good. Uh, my, myself, everything seemed real good. Uh, the blood work I have to do tomorrow because I have to fast. Um, I also go to the VA for my heart on Tuesday. Uh, as far as Brian, uh, last month he was supposed to see the specialist and um, we don't know how he figured it out, but. Uh, he balked in the morning and uh, got very hostile. And uh, to avoid any problems, we just backed away and canceled the appointments. And we have him rescheduled for this month. And uh, his brother is gonna go with us. And um, we'll see if everything goes all right. Um, that's with the surgeon. Um, we don't know how he knew uh, when we went to the PCP this week, we promised him taking McDonald's, and we don't know if that did the trick because he went right along with us, and there was no problem. So we're hoping that happens again on the on the fifteenth. Sometimes all it takes is McDonald's. <laughs> That's usually the case for me too. So we'll keep all those in our prayers. Thanks for uh, keeping us. Uh, Updated on your family and Rich and everything that's uh, going on. Thank you, Paul. Uh, Ron. First, I'd like to thank God that I, I got a new job over the last number of days. Also, also my uh, mother-in-law needs prayer. She's uh, declining in health, and my daughter is, has COVID. And I'd like to wish my brother-in-law, Sam and Clinton, a happy birthday, and my friend Mike a happy birthday. Okay. We'll keep all of them in our prayers. Is Mike, well, you brought him with you a couple weeks ago, right? Well, bring them back. <laughs> okay, we'll keep all those in our prayers, and congratulations on getting that uh, new position. I uh, talked Karen. to Nancy Price this week, and she's coming along. She misses everyone, but she's watching. Good. That's why we keep doing it. I mean, maybe that's one good result of COVID, that uh, people can, who can't get out can still see the service. I'd like uh, prayers for my friend Dorothy, who's having her shoulder operated on tomorrow. Okay, we'll keep Dorothy having her soul, uh, shoulder operated on. I almost said soldier. I don't know where my head. Any, uh, any others today? Uh, oh. Charlie, do you have one, or are you just pointing to something? You want to vet it first? <laughs> um, he's asking for prayers for um, both Pap Pap and Dada, my mom and dad. Uh, they're, they're hobbling along. They both have knee issues right now. But my mom's going to a chiropractor, and dad has to go to an orthopedic surgeon, I think, okay. to, get, to find out what his next steps are. We'll keep both your parents and uh, grandparents in the prayers. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, again, we lift up all those that were mentioned here today, Lord. And uh, there's some celebrations, uh, new jobs and that sort of thing. And also some concerns and surgeries and doctor visits. And Lord, we pray that no matter what season we are in life, sometimes we feel like we're in a dark winter. And sometimes we feel like we're in the bright sunshine of the warmest day. But no matter where we are in the season of our lives, we always know that you are with us. That's what our faith is all about, Lord, that the ups and downs of life, that we are there, and 
We need to keep our compass focused on you, the one who is the true north, Lord. And uh, I know it's hard to do at times, Lord, when we face challenges in life. But Lord, help us by your Holy Spirit to stay connected to you. Help us to read your word, to pray, because the evil one wants to discourage us when we need you most. Lord, don't let him get his way. And we lift all, everything up here today, as well as those things that were not mentioned, or persons who are watching online, whether live or later recorded, Lord. We pray that together uh, we may be one community. We pray all these things in the strong name of Jesus. And remember the prayer that he taught to his disciples that we lift up this day as our prayer, the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So today, we're going to look at the scripture, how Jesus talked to the thieves on the cross, and uh, he said to the one who was repentant, today you will be with me in paradise. Remember last week, we looked at, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. So now this is the second one that also comes from the Gospel of Luke. Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insult at, at him, aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence? We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve but this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. The word of God for we who are the people of God. Gracious God, as we come to look at Jesus' second words from the cross, I pray that the words of my mouth, the meditations of all of our hearts would be acceptable in your sight as we pray in Jesus' name, amen. So of all the Gospels, from beginning to end, Luke highlights a special concern for what is called the least, the last, and the lost. He's always concerned about those who are the outcasts, those who are lost, Think about the, pre -parable, the three parables of the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son. All of them appear only in the Gospel of Luke. So it's uh, no wonder that if there's a conversation that takes place between Jesus and the criminals that hung alongside him on the cross, that story is only told in the Gospel of Luke. Now the other Gospels say that there were thieves on both sides of Jesus, but only Luke has a conversation that actually took place. It was only Luke that has Jesus born in a stable. There is no manger, no Christmas story with a manger without the Gospel of Luke, a place that was meant for the feeding of livestock. So in Luke's description of Jesus' ministry, we find consistently concern for the sinner, the outcast, the unclean, and the nobodies. In the Gospel of Luke, Jesus clearly identifies his mission that we see in Luke chapter 9, verse 10. It is to seek and to save 
the lost. It is not surprising that only Luke's gospel records this conversation Jesus has as he hangs dying beside two thieves. As we look at this conversation, we'll focus on the words of Jesus and ask, what does the scene teach us about Jesus and what does it teach us about ourselves? It is said that a person is known by the company that one keeps. Most of us probably remember our parents, like if we, we had a friend or someone we hung out with that they really didn't like because they got into trouble, what would they tell us? Why would you hang out with that person? You know, you're just going to get in trouble, right? So in life and while dying, Jesus associated with sinners. Listen to the words from Luke 15, the first two verses, and we'll see this. these words often appear throughout the Gospel of Luke. It says, Now the tax collectors and sinners were gathered around to have hear Jesus, but the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, that this man, he welcomes and he eats with sinners. We see the association throughout Jesus' ministry. He lived out his personal mission statement to seek and to save the lost. Jesus allowed a prostitute to wash his feet with her tears. He called tax collectors and garden variety sinners to be his disciples. He touched lepers and he ate with unclean people. When Jesus called fishermen uh, to be his disciples, it wasn't like we would think of fishermen. Fishermen were known as roughnecks, uh, not the most high up people on the social scale. But those were the first people that Jesus went to when he called his ministry, them into ministry. So in Jesus' day, non-religious people generally didn't like associating with religious people. They likely felt that they had to watch their language, pretend to be something they weren't because they did not want to feel the judgment and the scorn of religious people. And you know, that's still something that, that has not changed in 2,000 years. Many non-religious and non-religious people still feel that way today, right? They don't want to go to church because why? They feel they're going to be what? judged, right? And they don't want that. Uh, so, you know, we often say that we are open and we're welcoming, but then we don't always practice that. We look and we judge. And nothing changed. That was exactly the way it was in the day of Jesus. But when Jesus was around non-religious people, they didn't feel small or belittled. They didn't feel like nobodies. They didn't feel like sinners. They just felt like people who came to hear the good news of God that made sense to them. And they found that they wanted to know more about this God that Jesus talked about. Jesus gave his personal mission statement just days before he was crucified. He had gone into the town of Jericho and he made his way to this large sycamore tree in the center of the city. Now, when Jesus was making his way to Jerusalem, you'd read throughout the Gospels, especially the Gospel of Luke, and it would say that Jesus turned towards Jerusalem, or he set his face toward Jerusalem. He wasn't going there to visit family. He wasn't going there on vacation. He was going there at the time of the Passover because he would become the Lamb of God sacrificed on the cross. And so uh, he comes into Jericho, which is about just three miles downhill, downhill from Jerusalem. Remember the story of the Good Samaritan also appears in the Gospel of Luke, uh, where the robbers uh, attacked someone on that road. So it was a, a road from a high elevation to a low elevation with a lot of switchbacks, a lot of places for robbers to hide. So that... That is where Jericho is. It's one of the lowest places on the planet, near the Dead Sea. And so there he encounters a man, a tax collector, by the name of Zacchaeus. And he says to Zacchaeus that today I am coming to your house. Salvation has come to your house. And he went to Zacchaeus' house for a meal. Now, 
he sold his soul, Zacchaeus did, to the Romans, buying the right to collect taxes for them. That's why tax collectors were hated. And there wasn't any forms like you fill out now for you know, the federal, state, or local governments. Uh, instead, you made your money by collecting what the Romans demanded, and anything else that you got beyond that by hook or by crook was yours to keep, right? So uh, tax collectors were very much hated and put into the category as traitors in the same category with prostitutes and um, other sinners. But when Jesus came to Zacchaeus' home, Zacchaeus would have invited all his sinner friends with him. And at that time, if you ate with somebody, that meant that they were your friend. And Jesus went to Zacchaeus' home for a meal. Now, I'm sure Zacchaeus, as I said, invited all his sinful friends over for supper that night, prostitutes, tax collectors, thieves. And I can imagine, as they did, the religious leaders saying that this man eats with tax collectors and sinners. That's why they ultimately crucified him. And Jesus responded with his personal mission statement that I said earlier this morning from Luke 19.10. He says what? That Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. So as Jesus lived, so he died. Even as he was crucified, Jesus carried out his mission statement to seek and to save the lost. Associating with sinners, Jesus did not die alone. Three times Luke used the word to describe the men being crucified on his right and left as kakargai. And that is translated as those who do evil works. That's what Luke, the word is used there from Luke. Now Matthew and Mark record the story also. They use the term lestai, which means armed robbers. So when you put them together, those who do evil works and armed robbers, I think the English translation of thief is a fair assessment. So the scene of Jesus and the two armed robbers, I believe it is one of the most powerful in all of the Bible. Jesus, the only fully righteous and sinless human being who spelled out his mission to seek out and save the lost, had his final conversation in this world on the cross with a criminal and a thug who was rethinking life in response to Jesus' character and mercy. And what did Jesus do? He offered the man eternal life. All of this, again, begs a very crucial question for us as his body with Jesus as the head. So in other words, if we're part of the body of Christ, which means we're connected, think about how Jesus related to people. If this is what mattered most to Jesus, reaching people, what does that mean for us as his followers? If Jesus wasn't afraid to associate with criminals, prostitutes, and people who are considered unclean, how do we make that same application for us? Another thing we can see in this scene as we look at the two criminals crucified on either side of Jesus is two possible responses that we might make to Jesus. So it really sets up as a dual response uh, when we look at these two thieves on the right and left of Jesus. Both criminals saw the same thing that day, didn't they? A man who claimed to be the Messiah, the revolutionary king, abused and crucified. They saw all the cruelty and hate heaped upon Jesus by the crowd. And they were there when they heard Jesus say, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. They heard those words, and they must have been aghast because nobody was expecting to Jesus to act the way he did. This was the man who was, all the palms were thrown down, Hosannas on Palm Sunday. They thought Jesus was going to take the kingdom by force. That's what they were celebrating on Palm Sunday. Instead, he allowed himself 
to be what? Crucified and allowed this to happen to him. And they heard, the thieves on the cross heard Jesus say, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they are doing. But they had a very different responses to him, didn't they? All four Gospels tell us that Jesus was flanked by these two criminals, but only Luke tells us about the conversations that took place. One of the criminals joined the crowds in deriding Jesus and making him feel small and belittled. He looked at Jesus and saw a failed Messiah, a man who naively, even ludicrously, call people to love their enemies. A man who claimed to be the Messiah, the King, the Anointed One, and yet this man refused to take up arms to fight the Romans. That's what almost every Jewish person was looking for at this time. They suffered generations of different empires coming in and controlling and oppressing them. From the Assyrians to the Babylonians, uh, to the Persians, to the Greeks, and now the current empire, the Romans. And they thought Jesus was going to restore the throne of David, where Israel was a mighty kingdom under David, then reaching its pinnacle under Solomon. That's what they were looking for. And they didn't understand when Jesus said to them, Father, forgive them, they don't know what they are doing. So one criminal, he joined with the crowds. He looked at Jesus and saw, as they did, a failed Messiah. Called people who, to love their enemies. A man who claimed to be the Messiah, the King, the Anointed One, and yet who refused to do anything about it, in their opinion, by picking up arms and fighting. This criminal was angry when he heard Jesus pray, Father, forgive them, they don't know what they are doing. He shouted at Jesus. He turned to the cross. And it must have took him, as again, this man was being crucified too. So for him to get up a voice enough to shout would have been incredibly painful. And he shouted, you're the Messiah. Save yourself and us. But his heart was hard, wasn't it? He did not understand or see the way of Jesus. But something happened to the heart of the other criminal. And I only have one explanation for it. And that is the Holy Spirit, right? The Holy Spirit got a hold, but he was open. See, we have to be open to the Holy Spirit. If we harden our hearts, we will never hear the Holy Spirit. But this criminal, even though he lived his life, the entire way of being hard and seeking revenge and being a toughened criminal, he had to allow his heart to be softened by the Holy Spirit. So at some point, he stopped hurling insults and he spoke up and he rebuked, or in our modern vernacular, we would probably use the word told off, right? He told off the other criminal. This guy might have thought, my life is hopeless now. I'm going to die in a matter of hours. And it's going to be a very painful, excruciating hours. Humiliated and defeated. See, when the Romans put someone on the cross, they didn't just want to execute them. They wanted to intimidate and make an example of and totally humiliate that person. So you look at that and say, I don't want that to happen to me, so I'm not going to engage in certain types of uh, activities like Jesus did. So that's why they are stripped naked, right? Or pretty close to naked because they, they wanted them. This is a culture that people covered you know, themselves. Uh, so they wanted to totally not just kill the person, but to make a public embarrassment and spectacle out of that person. And had, as I talked about last week, where people would gather around. I think one of the reasons they didn't have much other entertainment, so public executions were, I mean, frankly, I think something to do. They didn't have books for the most part. The average person, there wasn't Netflix or TV or Penguin or 
pirate or steal our games or you know, movies or any of that above. Uh, so this guy might have thought, my life is hopeless now. And he, he turned to Jesus. He thought, maybe, just maybe, Jesus might be my hope. You see, when we open our heart even this much to God, the Holy Spirit can come in. It doesn't take much. I, I see that throughout the scripture. When people put forth a little bit of effort, a little bit of effort and trust God, God comes and meets us there. I always go back to the feeding the 5,000. The disciples wanted to send all those people away. And they ex turned to Jesus and they expected him to send them away or him to fix their problems. And what he said is what? You go out there and find them something to eat. You go do it. And when they did come back with a few loaves and fish, what did Jesus do? He multiplied it. You see how he met them when they opened up their heart and not let it be hard? So he thought, this thief on the cross thought, maybe there's a God who cares for the hopeless. Maybe there is a God who gives second chances. But the second criminal says, don't you fear God since you are under the same sentence? We are punished justly for we are getting what we, our deeds deserve. They knew they were robbers and criminals. They weren't like Jesus. They were really criminals. But this man, talking about Jesus, he says, this man has done nothing wrong. And then, whether from the emerging faith and understanding of what Jesus was doing, or from a sense of compassion that prompted him to attempt to encourage Jesus, he spoke to Jesus and he said these words. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. So in the Bible, the word remember me meant, it wasn't like don't forget me, know who I am. It meant to always help me and deliver me from what is coming at me. In the Old Testament, when God remembered individuals, God delivered them. In Genesis 8.1, God remembered Noah and saved him from the flood. In Genesis 19.29, God remembered Abraham and spared his nephew Lot from the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. In Genesis 32.22, God remembered Rachel when her womb was bare and opened her womb so she could have a child. In Exodus 2.24, God remembered his covenant with Abraham and delivered the Israelites from slavery in Egypt. So when someone says, remember me, what they're asking for is to help me and to deliver me out of a tough situation. The bandit on the cross said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. What he really was saying was, deliver me from the place of the dead where I am going. Remember that in the Old Testament time, the, has the cross happened yet? No. So they could not enter the presence of God. They were stuck in what David, if you read through the Psalms, David often used the word sheol. Now, the, that would be the Hebrew word. The uh, Greek word would be Hades, and the English word would be what? Hell, right? And now, it wasn't like we think of hell now, but it was, they could not enter the presence of God because Jesus did not die yet on the cross and was not resurrected. So they had to go to a place that was like a holding place, I like to describe it as, you know how you go and you wait for your car to get fixed or, you know, or maybe a doctor's appointment, like a waiting room, or I don't know, maybe the, when you're getting your license renewed and you go there and they say you have a two and a half hour wait at the DMV or something like that. And what, you're not, are you excited to be there? No. That's why in the Old Testament, the idea of the promised land wasn't heaven, it was having lots of family, lots of children, and land, like remember the, the, what was promised to Abraham, it was essentially came down to land and family. And so uh, that's what people would look for. So this thief was know that at the very best, he was going to go to a place, a waiting room, to await his judgment. Now, his judgment probably wasn't going to turn out very well without Jesus, was it? it, it without Jesus, he was in deep doo-doo. Okay, so he said, deliver me from the prison I am destined for. Remember me as the one who turned to you on the cross. 
In this world, there are some who, when they consider Jesus on the cross, they still see nothing more than a disillusioned man dying, a naive, sad, weak man, and they reject him. There are millions of people in our world today who see Jesus as, you know, probably a good teacher, a nice guy, maybe like Buddha or something like that. Um, but they see the idea of resurrection as something that the early Christians just made up to make them feel good. That Jesus ultimately died on the cross and that was the end of Jesus. But others see in Jesus love embodied. God incarnate, given his life to get through to the human race. God freely laying down his life to take upon himself the poison of the world's sin. God seeking to reveal to the world the depth of God's love. Such individuals see in the cross a hope of salvation and a second chance. So you see this, there's two criminals that have two responses. Now here's the question for each of us. We must ask ourselves, you're one of the thieves. We are all the thieves. Like We are all sinners that have fallen short of the glory of God. So we're both, we're, we, we are those thieves next to Jesus. Now the question is this. This is the ultimate question. Which thief are you going to be? Right? The repentant thief or the thief that continues to insult and reject Jesus? Uh, the repentant one or the one that is told, today you will be with me in paradise. So what's interesting I think is the thief asked Jesus for what? Remember me when you come into your kingdom. But Jesus turns this into a different word, doesn't he? Does he promise him the kingdom? No, he doesn't. Now, the kingdom's good. That's, that's when Jesus, you know, is in control and where he lives and reigns. But instead, he promised him paradise. The question is often asked, what happens to us when we die. I believe that from what Jesus told the thief along with scripture, such as um, 2 Corinthians 5 8, coming from the Apostle Paul, he says, We are confident, I say, and would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. And the way I paraphrase that is when we are absent from the body, we go into the immediate presence of the Lord, right? There's no wait. We go right to be with the Lord because of what he did on the cross. You know, look at Ephesians, it says when Jesus went down into the lower parts, meaning that he rescued everybody who was waiting for the cross and his resurrection. So now we don't have a wait, right? We are in me we're not like those folks in the Old Testament up until the cross. They had to go into the, the waiting room. We don't have to wait. We can go into the immediate presence with God if we know Jesus as our Lord and Savior. So the other thing that he, I want to break this apart a little bit uh, for the remaining of our time together. The first part I want to look at, he says, you will be with me. Jesus told the thief that he will be with him. Even as this criminal was dying for his crimes, Jesus did what? He offered salvation. Jesus didn't say, before I can offer you salvation, I need to make you fully understand some things. Do you believe in the Trinity? Do you believe that I am fully God and fully human? Do you believe in the Bible? Have you been baptized? Have you accepted me into your heart? No. Jesus saw that this man was reaching toward him, and what did he offer him? Paradise, right? Isn't that amazing? All the guy reached out to Jesus and said, remember me, and Jesus turned to him without any other conditions or any other words and says to him, today you will be with me in paradise. Doesn't our God do amazing things? He promised him paradise. These final words about, they're about God being God. It is his kingdom it is his creation. You know what? God can do whatever God wants to do. 
That's why he's God. So he said, today you're going to be with me in paradise. The second part here, I want to look at the word paradise, because I think it's very interesting. He doesn't, promise, he doesn't say you're going to be with me in heaven. He doesn't say my kingdom, as the thief asked for. He says, he uses the word very specific, paradise. So the Greek word for paradise means a king's garden that is a transliteration of a Persian word that would include a majoran, meaning like a zoo, right? Combined with beautiful gardens. Think about this. Beautiful gardens, trees, water features. When someone was honored, they were given privilege to enjoying the king's garden. So what Jesus is really talking about here, he's talking about Eden is what he's talking about here. He says, I love this picture of paradise, the king's garden. The thought of spending eternity in the king's garden with people I love without hate or violence or stress or anxiety. Does that sound like paradise to you? It sure does, doesn't it? It's like going to the best uh, island, I don't know, in, in the South Pacific or the Caribbean or whatever, and, you know, just having the, the parrots and the birds and the beautiful fish, you know, snorkeling, and there's no stress, no anxiety, you know, and you have that for how long? Eternity. That's what God promises, eternity. And, you know, Jesus is the one, we may not have a perfect understanding of what it's like on the other side of the door of death. But I want to share with you, these are not my words, but it's a very short devotional called I Know My Master. And it says, Author Unknown. And it's been around for a while. I don't know if you heard or not, but I'd like to share this with you. It says, a sick man turned to his doctor as he was preparing to leave the examination room and said, doctor, I'm afraid to die. Tell me what lies on the other side. And very quietly, the doctor said, I don't really know. I'm not totally sure. You don't know. You, a Christian man, do not know what is on the other side. And the doctor was holding the handle of the door and on the other side, which came a sound of scratching and whining. And as he opened the door, a dog sprang into the room and leaped on him with an eager show of gladness. Turning to the patient, the doctor said, do you notice my dog? He's never been in this room before. He didn't know what was inside. He knew nothing except that his master was here. And when the door opened, he sprang in without fear. I know little of what is on the other side of death, but I do know one thing. I know my master is there, and that is enough. Isn't that amazing that, like, the dog doesn't know what's on the other side of the door. All he knew was that his master is there. So when Jesus says, I open the door and knock and says, today you'll be with me in paradise, we have to just trust him at the word. It's, pretty, we, it's going to be pretty good because he's there. See, the Garden of Eden is often referred to as paradise. Eden, after all, was the king's garden, the garden of God. Adam and Eve were expelled from the garden because they disobeyed God, and human beings were forbidden from ever entering that garden again. Paradise was lost. But when Jesus went to the cross, he restored the lost paradise. And Jesus' words to the thief remind us of the promise that we have of dwelling in the king's garden with him. Do you know, the whole Bible, essentially, from, you have Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. By the end of Genesis 2, humanity has lost paradise. And then from Genesis 3, all the way to Revelation 22, it's all about what we need to do, and God working out, putting the dots together to show us that paradise is being rebuilt. And the very last chapter of the Bible says what? The heading. Anyone want to take a guess what it says? It says this. Eden restored. That is God's ultimate goal. Look at your Bibles, right? We need to start, maybe we need to start bringing our Bibles. Charlie has his Bible, right? The very last heading is Eden restored. And Eden means what? Eden is the paradise, right? Paradise restored. The restoration of paradise 
begin with the second of Jesus' final words on the cross. When he turned to that thief and he said to him, remember me. This guy didn't know anything. He just knew something was right about Jesus. And everything that he was doing beforehand was wrong. And what all the crowds were doing were wrong. And he turned in faith to Jesus and said, Remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus turned back and said, Today you will be with me in paradise. And that's what it's all about, folks. God's plan is not just getting us to heaven. Because he's going to restore this whole planet. There's, going to, there's not going to be an end. There's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. He's going to bring the paradise back of Eden. He's going to come, it's going to come back to what God originally created this planet to be. Not the whatever crappy place it is now, right? With all the wars and all the hate and all the anxiety and all the sin and everything that happens that we encounter all the time, the conflict, the fighting, the politics, that's going to end, right? It's going to end. And to me, that is exciting. And that's the promise that Jesus made to the thief. Today, not tomorrow, not 10 years from now, today, you're going to be with me in paradise. Amen. So next week, we're going to look, we're going to turn from the big things right down to a family level as we move over to the third statement Jesus made from the cross in the Gospel of John, where in a very touching scene, Jesus turns to the Apostle John and says, and points to Mary and says, John, this is your mother. And then he turns to Mary, his mother, because he knows he's not going to be around anymore. And he makes this family connection. And he says to Mary, Mother, this John is going to be your son. And what an amazing, amazing, touching scene that is. And the reason I'm talking about these things, because as I said last week, you think about how hard it is to speak from the cross, and we have these seven different statements in Jesus' final words that he gives to us from the agony of the cross. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for who Jesus is and who God is, that he can turn to someone like the thief who decides to turn to him in those last few hours of life and say, remember me. And we have such an amazing Savior that he was able to turn to him and make the promise that today he would be with him in paradise. Lord, we know that you give each one of us that same promise. All we have to do, if we have not already done so, is to turn to you and just say the words, remember me, and Jesus will respond to that and promise us eternal life. We thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. That's showing, indeed, it is a precious name of Jesus, and we'll sing the hymn. Uh, you can follow the PowerPoint or... Jump into the hymnal at page 536.
as we go forth, Jesus is indeed the hope of earth and the joy of heaven. There is no one else except Jesus. Go in his name. Go in the name of God the Father who sent him. And go in the name of the Holy Spirit. When we open up a little bit to Jesus, the Holy Spirit will pour in. Amen. Thank you.